Welcome to Legends in Leadership, brought to you by ISF and the Carrington Group. Legends in Leadership is an inspirational podcast featuring the stories of leaders who are making a difference. Our goal is to inspire you with the stories of leaders who come from humble beginnings, overcome challenges, and ultimately rise up to make a difference in people's lives. Well, hello, folks. Uh, episode number 73. We're back in studio. Excited about our guest today. Uh, my name is Tyler Tallman. I'm a family officer with the Carrington Group and my co-host on today's podcast, as usual, the great Dr. Blair Ritchie, uh, who's the executive director of the International Student Foundation, and Jason Smith, who is a partner of mine at the Carrington Group. As always, uh, we like to kick off our shows with a little bit of leadership uh, trivia. We're fascinated by the stories of leaders uh, who, like us, come from humble beginnings and then rise up as leaders to make a difference in people's lives. So, Dr. Blair, what is it that you have teed up for us today? Hopefully, it's challenging. It, it is. Okay. Uh, but you're going to get a big, okay. big, big, big historical event okay. took place on this particular date. 516 years ago. Oh, so 516 Pull back years. your history books here. Right. A legendary leader unveiled one of the most famous works of art in the city of Florence, Italy. He was born into a magistrate's family, but because his mother was ill, he was placed in a family of stone cutters. Stone cutters. Careful where you put your daycare, right? All right. <laughs> His father early on saw that his son had no interest in the family's financial business, so he allowed him to apprentice with one of Florence's fashionable painting workshops where he learned the art of fresco painting come in handy later on in his life. At the age of 14, he studied sculpture in the palace gardens of the powerful Medici family. He also obtained permission from the Catholic Church to study cadavers for insight into anatomy. We still today marvel at his amazing combination of talent, research, art, science. Today's legend was the ultimate Renaissance man who set his own standard as a brilliant painter, sculptor, architect, and poet. Who is this legendary leader? We'll be back at the close. By the, to... by the look on Jason's face, he I think he knows it. No, that's thoroughly confused look. That was a thoroughly confused look. Uh, maybe there, Cal... were, there were so many clues in there, you guys are going to just... Maybe Calvert's going to know it. Yeah. She's. I already know she's way smarter than we are. Uh, so. yeah, that's true. Yeah. Let's yeah. hope at least. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm excited about uh, today's uh, guest, uh, Calvert Collins uh, Bratton. Uh, she serves as the Vice President of Strategic Events and Relationships for Methodist Health System Foundation. Uh, prior to that, in 2015, she spent over a decade on television, a reporter in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, and then here in Dallas with Fox 4. She is a seventh generation Texan. I love that. Uh, born and raised in Dallas and then attended the University of Missouri. Uh, Calvert, and, and we got to talk a lot about this pre-show, is very passionate about our community helping others. So uh, all of her outside work where she serves as uh, president in, uh, in, in District 13's representative on the city of Dallas's Park and Recreation Boards, uh, interested in uh, the work that you're doing with the Safer Dallas, Better Dallas program, uh, Christ Family Clinic, uh, also the SMU Simmons School of Education board member, and SMU's 21st Century Council. Uh, she lives here in Dallas with her three young daughters, which include four-year-old twins. So you are definitely not bored for sure. Welcome to the show. Thank you all for having me. It's an honor to be here. Well, uh, Calvert, we're, we're glad to have you and, and we're excited to get to hear a little bit about your journey today. You're, you're a seventh generation Texan. So I, I really do like that. And I, I want to rewind the tape a little bit and hear about your early days growing up here in Dallas. I I got to hear you tell me uh, about just this rich culture that you have with uh, your your mom and dad and the things that they taught you. So tell us about some of the mentors that influenced you early on in your journey and uh, has brought you back to Dallas and, and doing the things that you're doing professionally. Well, thank you, Tyler. I certainly had a great start having very dedicated, involved parents. They divorced when we were young, but still were very active in our lives. And 
so I grew up in East Dallas, um, Swiss Avenue area, those beautiful historic homes and uh, a lovely part of Dallas. And then my parents divorced and we moved, my mom moved to the Park Cities and we went, to, my sister and I went to a public school in, in the Park Cities, graduated there and then went on to the University of Missouri. But we were both very lucky to have such strong, grounded parents both who were leaders in their own right, my mom civically and very active. In fact, she served on the city of Dallas Park Board in, uh, from 1980 to 1984. So she was actually pregnant with me when she was uh, on the board. So I learned it, it is literally in my blood. So uh, it's wonderful to come full circle where oh. now I get to sit on the board and, and serve as president. So this is so. technically your second round that you served on the board because exactly. you were with her then, right? I, I was much quieter then. <laughs> so then, um, but our parents have both been very involved in arts, uh, police, um, all kinds of various causes. I mean, for his, my father's passion is really historic preservation and education, pub, particularly public education, and, and our mom's um, arts, culture, parks. Uh, she helped start a rape crisis center. I mean, just many. We were we were learned we learned very early, not just from our parents but our grandparents, of how to be involved citizens in at whatever community you live, and that that is very important to give back to whom much is given, much is required. And so that was not necessarily repeated in our house. It was just a way of life. So I had mentors in my family, in, um, in school, and then in my profession. I chose very early to pursue broadcast journalism. So I kind of knew what I wanted to do at age 15. I realized I was odd in that regard, but um, had wonderful internships and exp exposure to the career at a young age and then um, all through college and internships at CNN and London and beyond and, and then started work right away and just had folks who guided me and mentored, whether they were professional acquaintances, professional colleagues or acquaintances, family, friends. I had a, a godmother who was there when I was born and is still a very close uh, family friend, advisor, and um, and confidant today. So I've been very blessed to have folks along the way who were shepherding me, my uh, growth, and but also um, looking out for my best interest. Now, as a, a parent of three, I'm curious. Three daughters. Three, three daughters. daughters. I mean, that it's is important that caveat. is important. I've got a five month uh, old little oh. boy right now, and that's enough. But three right. daughters. Uh, tell me, uh, what are some of the, the traits and things that were instilled to you as a young child uh, by your parents that you're now full circle being able to come back and, and share with your kiddos? Gratitude. That's a key one. I don't think you can instill that value enough in your children. Our children now are so much more um, well off, whatever, however that can be interpreted. But, you know, this generation, the one before Gen X, Gen Y, have been have grown up much more financially successful than their previous, their parents' generation and grandparents. And, but I think we, we so often forget to say thank you. I think gratitude goes beyond that in also paying it forward, just beyond the, the expression of, of gratitude. It's living that life as, and being understanding of what is around you um, and how you can support and give back to that. So it's a lot more than just a cursory, oh, thanks so much. Um, but that is, we really instill that in, and of course I wish my kids were a little bit more representative of that sometimes, but we are all, I feel like it's a constant battle. Manners is another big one um, in, because manners are never go out of style. And when, writing a handwritten thank you note, um, saying please, thank you, expressing, respecting your elders, that that will always be intrinsic in who I am. And I think it's important that kids understand that adults are not just disciplinarians. They're there to help, they're there to teach you, they care about you, but it's important to have that respect and deference to, to those elders. So that I encompass within manners. Um, understanding right and wrong, having a conscience, being able to, because if you instill that in your children at a young age and being a good person as an offshoot of that, um, they you won't have to worry about them making good decisions when they're in high school and in college, when they're out of the nest. So um, having those conversations early about, well, why did, 
why did you choose this decision? When you had that choice, why did you choose it this way instead of this way? And do you think that was the right thing to do or the wrong? And, um, and lastly, you know, compassion and kindness for others. Um, that is uh, so critical in who we are. I don't think enough of our society, I think we're all good people in, in our heart of hearts. I think people are really at their core good human beings. Then they get, they follow the wrong path or they follow the wrong person and then they get, they skew away from that. But so that's why I, I we really work on teaching our girls to do, we always ask them, what did you do today? And what is one thing, one kind thing you did for someone else? Because they understand what's nice and what's not, whether it's holding the door or, or being the line leader or um, helping someone get up from, you know, if they got hurt. So it's those little things that compounded will matter as they're teenagers and adults. That is just great and super valuable uh, information. Uh, Tell me, let, let's go back to uh, college for a second. So uh, you're a Missouri Tiger. Uh, and now the University of Missouri, I, I, is it a, a, that's a big broadcasting school and journalism Journalism, school. correct, yes. Okay, so you go to, you go to Missouri and uh, have, I'm assuming, a great experience there. And then uh, coming out of school, you start down this track of, of journalism. And uh, share with us a, a little bit about that. You go to Omaha, Nebraska, then you go to Las Vegas, uh, and then you end up in Dallas. But I, I know for every leader, there is uh, definitely their greatest achievement, but typically there's a fork in the road that has some disappointment with it too. So share with us uh, some of those disappointments that have, have kind of uh, led you down the track that you're on and, and got you back to Dallas. That's a great question because I think not only is there often more failure that leads to success, but also paying your dues. So often kids come out of college and they want to be the CEO. They think, I know this. I've got all this. I've, I've, I've gotten A's. I've had great internships I got I don't need to start in the mail room I don't need to yeah. start you know making a low salary my first job out of college with a college degree from arguably one of the best if not the best broadcast journalism institution in the country um, I made twenty five thousand dollars a year I actually qualified for section 8 housing but <laughs> I didn't know it uh, but I, I mean I thought and and I was grateful I was so excited to finally not have to ask my parents for money. Yeah. I was so ready to go, to be out on my own. And I'm obviously incredibly grateful that I had the opportunity to have parents who could pay for my college education. Um, but I worked all, I did work through high school. I worked through college. I just wanted to be on my own, have that independence. But to answer your question, I was fired from my first job and, or voluntary, I voluntarily resigned. <laughs> okay. So, but I was, I was very unhappy in that position. Basically, my, I'd been promoted, and then my, my show got canceled. And so I was still making an anchor salary and but doing reporter work. And so I knew I was likely going to be on the chopping block, so I could kind of forecast that. But there's still nothing like being fired. And I'm grateful that I have not been fired since. Um, but it really, boy, that teaches you to just you know, really dig deep and to find out who you are at your core. And it was my first job. Yeah. So I could have just given up on journalism. How long were you in that job before you got fired? I'm trying to think. A year and a half? Two okay. and a half? No. I started in 2005. So it was like a little over two years. Okay. And a lot of ups and downs, a lot of management changes. But regardless, I was, it was on my impetus to make something happen from that. And... Um, and so I, I got let go. It was somewhat, it was kind of public, which is awful too. And I'm 24 and I'm by myself. I had, my parents were here in Dallas. I was in Omaha and I just, you know, I, I shed a few tears. I'm not a crier, but I did the, on that. And I just, you know, you feel like a failure, sure. but the most important thing is you got to just dig deep and learn. Okay. At my core, I know I'm good at this. I know that I did, I was a good employee. I knew that I had the skills to, to catapult me to somewhere else. Now you just gotta pick yourself up, make those tapes, start sending them back out and see if somebody else would hire you. And you can feel sorry for yourself for a week, but then you gotta get back, you gotta hit the, hit the pavement. And so I wasn't going to let that failure define me in my career in, te in television or beyond. And so within a few short months, I got, I think I, 
I was let go at the end of June, and then I started in, in Las Vegas in early November. So I was very lucky. And certainly during the pandemic, a lot of people have been let go for reasons much beyond their control. But I, I always tell people, whatever happens in your circumstance, in most cases, it's not due to your fault. Um, even if it is, that doesn't define you. And so, but it's going to take some soul searching and to just stick to your guns and know what your your strengths and weaknesses are, and that will help propel you to finding the next job. Now, I, I grew up uh, with a long line of Nebraska Cornhusker lineage. Uh, my brother lives in Omaha as a UNL grad, so I'm curious. Missouri Tiger and 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 the Huskers they they typically have been a rival uh, in the past, but uh, the, I know that the Nebraska uh, uh, folks they tend to uh, get people to sway towards them. So in that 18 months that you were there, did you get any love for Nebraska? Oh, I do. I I love the pe everywhere I've lived. I've loved the people. I've loved the city, large, small, from. Uh, even football allegiances aside, I will still cheer for the Huskers. That living in Nebraska, the, it is some of the truly best human beings I have ever met. Salt of the earth, hardworking, um, just good, true values. Um, people that um, that are really that's what makes. I, I mean. Really, the heartland is a, is a wonderful place to live. I, I wish every American could experience life in, in the Midwest to understand that those farm values of, of getting up at five in the morning and going and milking the cows or, or bailing um, hay. Bail and hay, exactly. Yep. And um, even though I lived in the city, there a lot of families still had farming connections. And so, but just the, I mean, I interviewed Warren Buffett and Bill Gates actually together uh, which was a very interesting experience. But Warren Buffett lived in a modest home down the street from our TV station, and he went to McDonald's every day for breakfast. He drove a Cadillac. He was a Nebraskan. And people, I think, are attracted to that. And his, my gosh, he's experienced unbelievable success that he would never have predicted. And it's why people flock to Omaha every year for the uh, Berkshire Hathaway Oh, shareholders okay. convention because they want to hear from the oracle himself and he doesn't often have that these you know these prognostications that are just so out there he does he is he is a tried and true smart businessman and he is uh investing conservatively but um for many years and he's been a contrarian in many cases but they learn they just can't believe someone who is ex seen this much success could be so modest yeah. and that's really who he is and, and gates is too um in a lot of ways of course he's he's done so much philanthropically that's been world changing but um it, it just is that they were they were a fascinating duo to interview um and i i'm grateful for everywhere i've lived because then going from nebraska to las vegas is a is quite the culture shift but i Loved living in Omaha. I still love that city, and I, I, I do still cheer for the Huskers, except when they're playing my Tigers, which is not very often because they're a different conferences. They, they are, yeah. That that ended. So from the heartland, and as you said, to Sin City, you end up meeting your husband uh, mm -hmm. there. So talk about what uh, led you from Las Vegas to Dallas and being a part of Fox Four. So I was at a, the Fox station in Omaha, which was the worst station in the market. And and one thing as I was self evaluating during this kind of period of when I was looking for a new job and, and thinking, could I ever get, would somebody ever hire me again? I was very committed to working for a really great station. I wanted to be a great reporter that if, if I ever did want to go the anchor route down the road, I felt like it was, it was imperative that a good anchor be a very strong reporter first, because it teaches you how to really ask good questions and to be a good writer and to be a great listener. And so I wanted to go to a station where that was really, reporting was at its core. And so I was fortunate enough to get hired by the number one station in Las Vegas, which had a reputation for that. And it was still family owned and operated. And it was uh, the CBS affiliate KLAS in Las Vegas, actually now owned by Nexstar. But it was exactly that. And I became a much even a, a strong, a much stronger reporter, and I could turn stories quickly, and I got to interview some of the most fascinating individuals in Las Vegas um, because it's an international city, and people would come there for conventions or for tourism. Or, um, but I interviewed all a lot of casino moguls and mm -hmm. 
uh, just some very interesting people. I mean, politicians and business leaders and entertainers, and it just was a very fascinating place to live. It was kind of like living in a, um, a large vacation, like a, a never-ending vacation, because you had all this, every, everyone around you was practically on vacation. Sure, a lot of tours. And, uh-huh, and, my, and our station was right off the Strip, so every day I was on the Las Vegas Strip, yeah. and it was a very unique um, city, and it really, it really is a small town in terms of the community that supports it. Um, it's a very small philanthropic community and very wealthy, but very small. And um, but a lot. It's also very transient. Three percent of the population there is native. I married one of the three percent, and then of course took him away. But um, but it was there were some very core industries that were um, entrenched in the state and the city, and uh, so it was just it was a very fascinating place to live and work, but people don't often stay. And I think that hurts a city like Las Vegas because people don't plant roots. And so then they don't get involved in their community because they feel, well, I'm only going to be here for two to three years, so I might as well just leave. Great segue. Uh, And I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk about uh, just your leadership journey uh, here in Dallas and uh, some of your experiences here. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I'm, I'm really curious. You're an incredibly insightful person. Uh, and when I think about our culture today, we're in um, we're in some really interesting times right now. Uh, politically, uh, a lot of social unrest. Um, and, and I, I want to hear from you. What do you think uh, some of the greatest barriers that we've got to break down uh, as a community here in Dallas and, and, and as a community across the country um, to get better and, and, and talk about some of the challenges that leaders are facing uh, in this time? Well, I'm not sure, and I'm only 37, so I haven't lived that many years, but there is, I'm reading a book, Leadership in Turbulent Times, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, a wonderful presidential historian, and there are, there have been many divisive periods in our country. Um, war, certainly many around wars or social issues, certainly slavery being one of them um, years, many years ago. But it's certainly, we are in a very divided time, um, kind of at every spectrum. And I was in East Texas over the weekend, over the holiday weekend, and you can see there is very much a different feel there than there is living in the city of Dallas. Um, I think there are a lot of systemic issues related to the justice system, related to um, business that that need to be reevaluated. So um, all of this unrest that's come about, you know, because of uh, um, the uh, the issues with around, you know, the shooting of of, of of black men and women in in various parts of the country have have really, and I covered a lot of that years ago. Trayvon Martin and Ferguson and Uh, New York. I mean, I remember covering the protests that surrounded that, but now there seems to be more teeth to that, that we're not just going to, you know, the folks that the Black Lives Matter movement and and others that say we can't just be, we can't just keep talking about it and not doing anything about it. And so there is, there need, I think there needs to be systemic changes at multiple levels uh, because folks have been just not included in the, at the table in the past. Now, all that's to say that the conversation around police, you asked, you know, I, I was a uh, p- former president of Safer Dallas, Better Dallas, which is an advocate for law enforcement. And we've been able to, you know, purchase weapons and technology for uh, the Dallas Police Department, the DA's office in supporting law enforcement at multiple levels. So um, as an organization, we are certainly supportive of law enforcement. Does change need to happen, in, whether that's in the budget, whether it's moving officer, um, more civilians into police positions so that officers can get back on the streets? You know, we, we're certainly in support of supporting the law enforcement um, so that they're protected, they can do their jobs every day, they can protect the citizens um, and answer the calls for service. And so, um, but I think there's a larger issue that, that we need to evaluate how policing is done. It's not just the same, we give you a gun, we give you a car, you go out to the street, because they've been asked to take on so much more responsibility. They're counselors or social workers. Well, that's not what they were trained to do. And so maybe we should get the right people with that correct training out to support the officers whose duty it is to protect us from threats of violence and such. 
It always reminds me, Dr. Blair, of, of the quote from Breon, one of our uh, foster care kids who's uh, a part of now, I believe, the Frisco uh, right. uh, police mm -hmm. force. But he made a comment. He said that uh, it's not uh, the badge that makes the man. It's the man that makes the badge. And uh, I think that uh, being a part of the uh, the culture of our police departments and the theme of it is is really huge. Tell us about uh, your work on the City of Dallas Park and Recreations Board. I'm, I'm lucky enough to live right next door to a beautiful park in Dallas. Um, it's been a little bit eerie it's having everything closed and water fountains not working and, and things cut off. But talk about the work that you guys are doing and the importance of that here in Dallas. I'm glad you asked. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, the, so the City of Dallas Park and Recreation Board is a unique entity of 15 members were appointed by the City Council to represent the, the 14 council districts that are, are within the City of Dallas. And then um, there's a, the, the mayor has an appointment for a 15th as an at-large, all citywide uh, member. But we are as close to the eyes and ears of our parks and our rec centers and our spray grounds and aquatic centers and golf courses and tennis centers as as we can be. And so it's our job as the board to advocate to improve our park system uh, and make it as, as equitable and as inclusive as possible. So we have 397 parks, 220 playgrounds, 160 miles of trail, 43 recreation centers, um, over 20 community pools and plus 16 spray grounds. We are a tremendously large municipal park system. Our budget's about close to $100 million a year, and wow. the board oversees that. With a, We hire a director. We just hired, did a national search for that, um, which I had the privilege of leading. And so um, it is a big deal because parks are not just a nice to have, just they're not just quality of life anymore. They add tremendous value to neighborhoods, to um, urban areas. Look at what Clyde Warren Park has done for the urban core of Dallas. And now we're adding four parks in the core of downtown, the, the parks for downtown Dallas in partnership with the city of Dallas, with our um, department, park department, is adding acreage, beautiful green space to the downtown core because people want to live and work in the in near where they um, they want to live and work together but they also want to bike they want to walk they want to run walk their dogs or have a spray ground to take their kids and so parks are no longer just a you know check the box nice to have amenity they have added tremendous value to the city the ROI for example on the Katy Trail for the concrete that has been poured for that um, eight miles of trail has a 50 to one return on investment. I mean, okay, you're in the, the family planning or the, the, in managing family office businesses, family office business, that's a good ROI, it's a right? ROI. And so our traditional trails are seven to one ROI because people want to live. I'm, we're trying to live closer to a trail because our kids can take the trail to get to school. And so now people want to be able to bike to work or, uh, or walk to work. So, um, so there's a shift as we know people are going to be moving back to cities away from the, uh, the coastal communities. And so we need to have more um, opportunities for them to recreate, to utilize for um, outdoor space. We've seen record usage of our parks and trails during the pandemic because it was one of the safe, safest places and only few open places people could go. So it was hard to you know, make decisions about what to keep open, what to close, um, because we, wanted, we understood the, the mental, physical, social, and emotional value that our parks open spaces had. But we also on the park board, we oversee the zoo, the Arboretum, Clyde Warren Park, Fair Park, a tremendous amount, Katy Trail, and so many more in the city of Dallas. So it is a huge um, privilege, but also an obligation that we do so um, fairly and equitably and in, as inclusively as possible. It, it, my wife and I lived in, in Uptown for almost seven years. So this was pre Clyde Warren Park. And it was interesting because I remember us uh, being out and about and talking about it was a bit of sadness outside of Uptown. Our central downtown just 
there wasn't much concrete. going on. And uh, it was kind of dark and quiet and eerie at night. Uh, not a, Really not at all like the other major cities that you go to, whether it's Chicago or Boston or New York. And to see people going back to our cities versus right. the reverse commute heading out to this uh, wide metroplex is really cool. And there is so much opportunity, even, even more projects that are coming on board. Uh, I mean, a, a giant loop trail that's going to connect a lot of our existing trails because we don't have many of them don't connect to one another and we need that circuitous uh, trail system and so we've got one group that uh, the loop the circuit trail conservancy they're working to fund that then we've got the um, if you've driven down I-35 you've seen all the construction by the zoo there's going to be a, a deck uh, sim very similar to Clyde Warren Park there's the Southern Gateway Deck Park Foundation that's going to put a deck a park on top of that very similar to Clyde Warren um, Fair Park has a, a tremendous master plan to add a 14-acre community park on the fairgrounds at Fair Park, which would be tremendous for not just the grounds, but the communities that live around that, that have been uh, left out of a lot of conversations. And it's been, um, and so there will be a lot, there will be 1,400 new trees added at Fair Park. There's 277 acres there, so there's Incredible. really a lot to use. Um, but new, the zoo is having a, uh, has a tremendous new master plan that could be implemented. But also, we can't forget about our neighborhood park. You mentioned, Tyler, you live right next to a park. I'm sure you have used that park quite a we bit with, a son, with your son. But because that's, a lot of folks don't have a backyard. And if you live in an apartment, you, you often don't have a safe place to go and uh, recreate or play with kids. We need, we have a health and wellness, um, they add a tremendous amount of health and wellness uh, component to our cities and we need kids to get outside and be able to play and run around on a, um, a playground or play frisbee play football and and they don't have that option in the apartments that they live in so so we're really focused a lot on 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 adding um, healthy walkable safe green space in the southern sector and West Dallas and parts of East Dallas that that doesn't exist. What a tremendous way to bring together uh, all different shapes and sizes and ethnicities and, and cultures and demographics and, and all these different areas. Uh, to me, what a what a great first step in bringing our communities together and uh, appreciate your leadership very much uh, on, on helping in, in that regard. As we wrap up today, uh, I, I want to ask one final question. In 2018, uh, you were named uh, one one of the five, five, excuse me, fierce women uh, in Preston Hollow. And so I'm curious, uh, Calvert, tell me, what makes you a fierce leader? Wow, I haven't, it's odd to be considered fierce because I don't think of myself as like Beyonce, like Sasha Fierce. <laughs> but I, I think working a decade in television certainly taught me how not to take no for an answer. Sometimes you need to be persistent. I'm not afraid to ask for anything. Um, there's certainly a way to do it, uh, to be respectful and to have gratitude and, and a respect for the person that you are um, asking of. But I think if you are grounded in your values and what you're asking for, um, if it relates to our park system, or my job working for, for Methodist, where I believe in the doctors and the nurses and the caregivers because I've been that patient, I'm not afraid to ask for someone to support our cause. Um, and, and, and certainly for the park system, what is a, what is a more universal equalizer than, than a park? And so I'm very passionate about those, uh, those in particular, and because I feel like they're doing so much good for so many people. And so I guess I'm fierce because I'm not afraid to ask and I'm passionate about those causes. And that's something I tell a lot of young women that I mentor when they're interested in getting involved in their community or, or wanting to become a leader. I say, well, you got to start with knowing, you got to be exposed to a lot, you got to see what's out there. And then like a funnel, whittle that down to what you are passionate about because it, it where passion breeds um, interest and breeds um, that working hard for that cause. And so you got to find out what it is that brings you the most joy and that you will be more willing to, to, to not say no, not to accept no as an answer, but to keep pushing forward. And, and, um, and that's just a great, that's what I would like to leave with, with listeners. Don't take no for an answer. Keep persevering because you never know when that no will become a yes. That is really great stuff. And, um, <laughs> 
really inspirational. You know, there's just some people that you sit across the a table off in, in an interview that just kind of exude confidence and yep. uh, that are fun to talk to. And, and you're one of those, uh, Calvert. So it's been great to have you on the show today. This has been a lot of fun. Um, and we just uh, can't thank you enough for taking time out. I know uh, it sounds like an incredibly busy schedule to be with us. It is truly my pleasure. Any way I can help encourage or support or inspire anyone else, I've been very blessed in my life. And it, it's an honor to be here and to hope to help others. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Blair, it's time right, for the legendary trivia answer. And, and, and I have a hunch our guest is going to bail you boys out. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a sense of who the Renaissance um, artist was? I do. Okay. Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. Now that's a great great oh. segue because oh. it's not Leonardo, but it was his rival. Michelangelo. Yes, Michelangelo. Oh, Michelangelo. Michelangelo. Yes, Michelangelo. Wow. I, it was one of the it two. Was, I was, it, it was 50-50. One of the two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Michelangelo uh, on this date unveiled David. Oh. Wow. The great David. The great David, great David sculpture. In Milan right yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there you go, guys. Is that, that's in, uh, uh, that's in Italy, isn't it? It's, where it's, it's in Milan. Is it uh -huh. in Milan? Yeah, yeah. Last name Buonarato. Bonarotti. That's why I went by Michelangelo. Yeah, man, yeah, Bonarotti. <laughs> there you go. Terrific. Well, folks, uh, that's a wrap for our podcast today. On behalf of the Carrington Group and the International St uh, Student Foundation and our special guest, Calvert Collins Bratton, uh, this is Tyler Tolman wishing you a good day. Remember this, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, then you are a leader. Have a great week. Legends in Leadership is brought to you by the Carrington Group. Carrington Group is a family office with a passion for helping business leaders and their families make smart choices and fulfill their highest aspirations. To learn more about the Carrington Group, visit their website at www.carringtonfo.com or Google Carrington Group Dallas, Texas. ISF is committed to leadership development for aged out foster care and orphaned youth. ISF's mission is to transform these youth into tomorrow's leaders with scholarships, mentoring, and leadership training. To learn more about ISF, visit their website at isfsite.org or Google International Student Foundation to learn more. Securities offered through Regulus Advisors, LLC, member FINRA slash SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Regal Investment Advisors, LLC, and SEC Registered Investment Advisor. Regulus Advisors and Regal Investment Advisors are affiliated entities. Carrington Group and this broadcast are independent of Regulus Advisors and Regal Investment Advisors.